Hello, and welcome to Easter Eggs, right here on Hyper RPG. Uh, today we are talking to the team, the art team from Necropolis, uh, from Hairbrain Schemes. To the left of me is Fiona Turner, who's also worked on Shadowrun. Uh, across from me here, Holly Mengert, who has also worked on Shadowrun uh, before Necropolis. And across from me as well is Doug McGruger, who, uh, as well as Necropolis, has worked on things like Murdered, Dark Void, and Evil Dead Regeneration. Thanks for coming in, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, thanks for having us. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is the art team uh, from Necropolis, which is an upcoming game by Hairbrain Schemes. Tell us a little about a little bit about Necropolis. Uh, we're not the entire art team. <laughs> of course not. No, no there's, I would there's love. Lots of I would love to take credit for all of the artwork uh, in Necropolis, but that would be horribly, horribly wrong with me. Um, but uh, Necropolis itself is a third-person uh, roguelike dungeon crawler. Um, uh, you run around basically as uh, a, a thief-like character beating the crap out of everything you see. Um, it, it's a roguelike, so there's lots of dying involved. Uh, and <laughs> so much dying. Some people die more than others. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it, it takes all the, the straight-up inspirations from games like Spelunky, um, Dark Souls, uh, uh, Rogue Legacy, stuff like that. Um, it, it's, it's super fun coming out soon for uh, consoles and PC. Exciting. It looks, it looks really neat. When I saw the trailer, I've always been like enamored by the idea of Dark Souls, but for some reason I've never gotten into it. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I just don't enjoy the punishment as much. But I saw the trailer for this, and I'm like, all right, this is going to get me into this genre. This is going to get me to play this game, and it's because it looks so cool. So that's why you guys are here now. Tell us about, about making, you know, you guys are the ones. It's so easy to forget about how cool a game looks when we get so get, get focused on the mechanic and the story and whatnot. But... Visually, these things really like we, you can't get into a game that doesn't look good. Yeah, right. So, so where do you where do you start when you're given something like Necropolis? Uh, where do you start when you think of how do you make this special? How do you make it look so appealing? Uh, well, at least for for me, um, I come from uh, the animation side, and I know Holly does uh, as well. But we get a lot of the stuff that that we kind of draw from. Um, starting out with the concepts, um, starting out with the characters that, that we're given. Um, so the art directors, uh, uh, Chris Rogers and Mike McCain, will give us just concept pieces, um, really mood pieces more than anything else. Um, and we sort of derive where, where we're going uh, from that. Um, and then those are given off to Fiona to make awesome character models with. So you say, would you say the worlds come first and then the characters? Or do the characters sort of define the world around them? I, they, they, they live in the same place. I mean, you can't... Mm. If you're doing it wrong, you're defining a character before you're defining a world. Um, or, uh, at least in my opinion, um, in my experience, you, you can't have one without the other because they have to exist in the same place. It's kind of the chicken and the egg, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, they, they both kind of developed, I, I think, ar around the same time. And, yeah. So, so with three artists around the table and more on, on the art team... How do you make sure that all stays cohesive, right? The worlds and the characters, they all need to, they all need to fit the same theme. Uh, how do you make sure that that plays throughout the whole team? There's just a lot of communication. You guys all sort of working together. Is there somebody overseeing it all? Uh, it's, it's a combination, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we've got um, a great group of leads over um, at Hairbrain. Um, some fantastic, again, uh, comes down to the art director, um, kind of wrangling all the cats because I know... <laughs> If I had my way, I would go a completely different direction on one thing, and uh, everybody would go their own way um, on stuff. But yeah, keeping that that cohesive direction really comes down to um, the leads, especially in the beginning, um, because what you're going for is so so fluid. Um, when I came onto the project, um, probably about a, a year and a half ago, um, it wasn't the same game. Um, the core of it was the same, but visually, it was it was uh, way 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 different. Mm -hmm. um, so we started off in one direction and we still hadn't kind of found the sweet spot. What, what everybody knows of as Necropolis didn't necessarily exist visually yet. Um, and it was a long, relatively long process of, uh, discovery, um, for figuring out what exactly Necropolis was going to, uh, to be. And by now, I mean, we can kind of predict what things are, are Necropolis, um, and what things aren't pretty easily. Right, so you've, now you've, the theme has fallen <coughs> together now where it's almost driving itself. Yeah. All right, um, that's cool. I want to ask now about each of your guys' specific roles um, in, on the art team. 
And I'm going to start with you, Fiona, because you haven't said much yet. <laughs> um, uh, Doug mentioned that you do character design. Yeah, so I, I do some of the concepts, but for the most part, I just do the 3D modeling of the characters, and then I do a little bit of the rigging as well. Um, so, yeah. So do you do, so is it all the characters, or do you do the more with human characters, or more the monsters, or all which one? Them. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> cool, good. <True>. So, <laughs> so then when, when, you're, when you're putting together uh, the 3D models, right, uh, you, have, you have humanoid characters, you have monsters, you have spiders and skeletons, uh, how do you, where do you approach it as far as making it realistic, but also you know, not feeling the need to adhere to real anatomy? Yeah, there isn't a whole lot of realism in there. So um, it's for the most part, it's when you draw it, it's like you don't really think about how it's going to translate into 3D. You're just trying to get a really cool silhouette to start. And you want to make sure that like it fits with the rest of the world because we have a lot of like creatures with like angular parts to their anatomy and stuff. And if we draw something too smooth, it like all of a sudden doesn't fit with the rest of the world. So we have to adjust it. Um, and have like really like exaggerated features on them because if they look too close to real world, I feel like they're not as interesting and they don't fit with the rest of the world. So it's all about keeping it almost abstract? Yeah, and like it's like, so you start with the concept and make a really interesting silhouette with it. And then once the concept is approved by the art director, then you try to make it work in 3D. And sometimes that can be really hard because you don't like the 2D art doesn't always translate perfectly. <laughs> when when you're coming up with the concepts, are you thinking like, all right, this will look really cool when it's 3D, or this will be really hard to model, or are you just sort of, I'll figure this out later. It's kind of an I'll figure it out later <laughs> because I I like don't like to shy away from a challenge. Like I feel like if it's difficult to translate into 3D, then it's a good thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, Good like, <laughs> when we're given kind of what the monster is going to do, sometimes that kind of drives, like, what the concept is going to look like. Like, if he's going to fight with a claw, let's make it really big on his arm. Mm -hmm. Nice and intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Holly, how about you? What, uh, what's your specific role on the um, Necropolis team? Right now I'm a character animator. So I, um, I did, uh, a, like, a few weapon sets for our thief character. Doug did a lot of awesome thief animations, but I also worked a lot on the creatures and, like, the you know, the enemies that you fight in the Necropolis. Mm -hmm. And um, early on, there was a period where I think we kind of took the whole character team together in concept. And so there was an early period where I got to work on character concepts. But for the most part, my job has been uh, animation. But it's really easy once you get like a really cool model from Fiona to like, you know, uh, just it, it makes you want to animate them. You know what I mean? Like you get like big spiky creatures. It's like, oh, I can't wait to make that thing walk. <laughs> is there anything specific so. that, you've, that you've seen like something you want to drop or maybe tease that is just like, oh, this is so cool and it moves just so interestingly? Um, I really enjoyed animating the gem eater. He's like this big kind of brutish shark character. And the fact that he, I feel like he's less brainy than some of our other characters, so he just kind of, you know, throws his weight around the, the necropolis, and he was really fun to do, like, kind of rogue flailing attacks for and stuff. So the animation so is coming not only from the design, but also from the, the character itself, like who they are and what they do. Yeah, yeah. It, a lot, like, uh, each of our characters, I feel like, had a pretty specific design in, like, how they would attack. And so that, you know, it, and that would drive, like, oh, he's got this really big mouth. He's going to use it, you know, really big claws or or this thing is poison. And, and so that, that was really helpful, you know, from an animation standpoint. It's so like, okay. The, so the gameplay development also helps define yeah. how how you're going to be doing these Yeah, things. absolutely. All right. And Douglas, tell, let's hear more about your specific role. Uh, I'm animation lead, uh, technical animator, animator, uh, help out with telling characters what's going to be awesome and what's going to be horrible and <laughs> making them redo stuff. Uh, lots of rigor, um, a whole bunch of miscellaneous things on the character side. Cool. Now we talked, uh, before we were on air, we talked off mic about you worked really hard on the trailer for Necropolis. Yes. Um, which uh, I'm pretty sure somebody's posted it in the chat already. Uh, the Necropolis, of course, is a Steam page. You can Google Necropolis and you'll find it. Yeah. Um, but the trailer's neat. Check it out if you haven't. Uh, but tell us a little bit about that, about about how you put together a trailer. Oh, God, which one? Um, no, we've uh, we actually had uh, three different trailers, um, and all of them have been significantly different um, experiences. The first one uh, was kind of the one that um, one of the art directors, Mike McCain, put together. Uh, that was a fantastic, amazing trailer that kind of set the bar and set the 
uh, the standard for what we uh, were doing. It's the first one that we did that we had the the red flashing sort of iconic death scenes mm-hmm. uh, for the characters. Um, and it was really successful. It was a fantastic, amazing trailer. Um, that was the one you unveiled at E3, right? That was the was it PAX? PAX. That was the PAX one. East trailer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we had a trailer at PAX East. Um, we did another trailer for PAX. And then I think we just recently did a trailer. I have no idea what we did it for. Um, but uh, for the I, internet, yeah, for, for the you internet, guys, for for you guys out there. Um, uh, no, I remember not sleeping for a while, and then the trailer came out. Uh, but um, the the second two, um, we were, were taking kind of the the lessons that we learned and the style that we had established with uh, the first trailer, um, and just sort of building on it. Um, all the trailers that that I've been involved in have kind of come from just a high level general story idea of okay, this is the trailer that we want to show that you're going to die a lot. This is the trailer that we want to show off that uh, we're introducing multiplayer um, and how difficult the game is going to be. So each of them have this sort of theme running through it. Um, And we'll go through and we'll get uh, an animatic for the trailer. I'll get an animatic for the trailer and we'll start grabbing footage and we'll start, you know, making lists of shots that we want um, and things that we want to make, uh, uh, you know, highlight, um, point out and make look cool. Um, and then we'll, uh, run through it, throw it away two or three times, um, <laughs> redo it, <laughs> recapture a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then somehow, um, at the end we have something that, uh, the internet likes, uh, or people like, um, and it tends to be really successful. Uh, so I, I don't want to change any of that other than the sleep part. Um, <laughs> That'll come. It'll come. Yeah, you know that. They keep Stop. telling me. Uh, somebody keeps telling me that after games are done, uh, we'll sleep. But there's always new games to make. That's fun of it, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stop. You no. Know. Yeah. Um, so when when you're coming up with the trailer, right? You come up with the themes, right? This is the yep. death ones, the multiplayer one. Do you have to go to the dev teams and be like? You need, to, you need to work on multiplayer stuff so we have enough to show. Do you have to sort of get that going, or are they far enough in oh advance? Oh my gosh, of you? no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge. That's one of the the exciting parts um, <laughs> about uh, doing trailers is that um, we're we're capturing video and we're making trailers and we're highlighting things um, inside the game that are works in progress. So. Um, I would come in, uh, uh, for example, on the last trailer, and uh, I would have everything like settled and everything nice. I'm like, okay, uh, I think we've got these three shots done, so I can mark those off, and then uh, lighting would change. Or we're like, ah, we're going to change the NPCs. Or uh, this week we've got a bug where nobody attacks and everybody dies uh, the second you see them. Um, or, oh, look, uh, design has come in and made the game super, super, super hard, which it is, uh, which is fantastic. Um, but now I can't get down to the second level to actually uh, fight anything. Um, so, yeah, it is it is constantly, constantly a challenge uh, to to try and present what appears to be a final game in something that is very, very, very much a work in progress. Has, has working on... Uh trailers made you like now when you see even a movie trailer you're like these guys have no idea what they're doing yet like has it sort of changed your <laughs> has this changed your perspective of viewing other things like that oh yeah ha- yeah absolutely you have to uh you have to look at it and kind of understand that uh what they're showing you is just somebody's general idea of what it may look like sometime in the future especially with games because game trailers tend to come out so far ahead of mm. of when they're um, when they're actually showing. And Often before there's even gameplay to show. Yeah, exactly. So you're looking at either pre gameplay or like smoke and mirrors stuff. I mean, even uh, when we were doing trailers, you know, a, a decade ago, um, we were rendering things out in Maya, in hardware renders mm-hmm. from a fake gameplay camera. Like, this is what gameplay is going to be like. <laughs> Woo! Um, <laughs> And it was just so tongue in cheek, uh, but that's that's kind of what um, that's kind of what we had to do, uh, just to get that to not derail the dev team because they're trying to make a game. They're the engineers are trying to make uh, specific types of gameplay. Um, the designers are trying to you know make the gameplay good, and we're not the only ones trying to show it off. But we're the only ones trying to show it off in this very specific one-off sort of way. So. 
any tiny little bit of engineering help that we can get to like make God mode happen, or can I detach the camera from the player? Uh, it, those are like just gems that that we have to hold on to. There's a little bit. There's, there's definitely a lot of obfuscating the truth when you're making a trailer, uh, <laughs> or or trying to be like, uh, trying to predict the truth almost. Yeah, exactly. Um, we don't. I mean, nothing that we've created in in any of our trailers is not something that we can't do in gameplay. And that's actually the great thing about um, the Necropolis trailers is that all the gameplay pieces that we have captured have been like from a gameplay camera um, with gameplay animations that we have uh, that play out exactly like they're supposed to. So that one's not smoke and mirrors. No, that one, the, the Necropolis trailers honestly have been like the least smoke and mirrors of any trailer I have ever worked on. Um, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, it's super amazing to be able to actually capture all that stuff in game. Cool. It's been more, more smooth and more straightforward uh, than any other trailer I've done. That's great. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about you guys more personally um, about how you got into the industry uh, and how you started doing video game art. But first, I want to hear about how you started getting into video games at all. Right? Everybody has that that first game, that story where they didn't even know what they were. They just thought they were hanging out, playing a toy, and then it became your life. Um, so, Holly, let's start with you. Okay. How did you? <laughs> How did you get swept into the world of gaming? I I feel like my first uh, real experience with games was playing uh, Mario Kart on the N64 with my brother and his friends, mm -hmm. but I was terrible at it. I was always running into walls. I would go backwards. I would fall off the track, so I always came in sixth place. It was a consolation. I'm that way now. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Well, that's the thing, and I was like, I didn't, they were like, they didn't really want to play with me, I think, because I was so bad at it, so I kind of, like, started to do it on my own time and eventually, like, beat all the levels and got the backwards special <laughs> levels, and I feel like that was my, my first experience with the game being, like, no, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make sure I can do this. The addiction of unlocking stuff. Yeah, yeah. Cool. What about you, Fiona? How would you fall in love with games? Um, well, originally I played on the Atari 2600, which my parents had, and nice. I didn't understand how anyone could play video games because my hands would hurt after like 15 <laughs> minutes. Yes. And then it wasn't until I was in like fifth grade, one of my friends got a Nintendo 64 and it was playing Mario Kart where I was like, I need this system. <laughs> and so like... One Christmas, like, I conspired with my sister, and it was the only thing we put on our Christmas list, so they would have to buy it for us. <laughs> and then we got one, and then my dad was like, oh, I think you'd like this game, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. It sounds like something you might like. There you go. I was like, okay, whatever. And he bought it for me, and that game, I just got totally immersed in that world, and I would play it, like, over and over and over again because I just wanted to be in that world. Mm -hmm. And then... It wasn't for a few years that I realized that people make games. <laughs> and then I was like, that's a thing I can do. And we're going to get to that realization because I want to know about all of you. Because there's a point where everybody's like, hey, you can do these things professionally yeah. in the world. Um, but first, uh, Doug, let's hear about your, your geeky origin story, if you will. Oh, God. Uh, I'm old. Um, <laughs> no, we, uh, my family got a, uh, an old Nintendo system. Uh, and me and my brother would just play Pong constantly. Uh, and ever since then, uh, it's, it's been constant. We got N64, or not N64, um, a Commodore 64. Uh, and played all the text adventure games, um, mm -hmm. old, old, old dungeon crawlery, text dungeon crawlery stuff. Um, and games have just been something that uh, have been a passion for mine, uh, of mine. Um, since then, and it's kind of just never, never stopped. So uh, we'll we'll stay with you. Where does art enter your life then? Where do you where do you become an artist? Uh, oh, did it start God. as were games and art always together in your mind? They were never together, honestly. Um, it, and, it, and it didn't actually hit that point where I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be uh, a, a game artist um, until college. Uh, some twenty some odd years later. Um, but uh, I'd always been drawing. I mean, my first conscious memory is of, of drawing. Um, and I actually wanted to be a comic book artist for the longest time. Um, I took like Joe Kubert's correspondence school. Um, I applied to the Joe Kubert school and they refused me. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, I went to the art Institute to, uh, to study, you know, uh, animation. Um, because I decided I wasn't going to be a comic book artist because uh, that's way too much work. Um, so I'll go into video games. Uh, no, actually, I, w I started off um, trying to be a concept artist. 
um, because that's just a natural progression. Uh, so I was going to do concept art storyboards for uh, for film. Um, so you're you're still eyeing just TV and film though. You're yeah, right. that yeah, was, I that, still. That's where artists. It's the works. higher media stuff and like video games because honestly, I didn't want to. I didn't want the two worlds to collide. It's like, okay, if I do something for a job, am I going to want to go home mix and do it? And pleasure? Yeah, exactly. I want to still love playing video games, and I don't want to ruin it by you know seeing how the the uh, the sausage is made. Exactly. <laughs> um, but then uh, I actually went to school at the same time as a couple other amazing, fantastic concept artists uh, were going to the art institute. Um, and I looked at their portfolios and we were supposed to graduate at the same time. I looked at their stuff that they were doing and I looked at the stuff that I was doing. It's like, if I was going to hire two people out of this graduating class, they would not be me. Um, so I started to get into uh, 3d and animation, which was just a natural progression. And then it, uh, my last year at the art Institute, it just took off from there. I'm like, I'm going to make games cause I don't want to make film animation does somebody tap you or somebody like hey this will be good in your video game or just that as you're doing animation you're like oh hey video games need to be animated i'll uh, try doing this yeah that's kind of what it was we had uh we ended up having a couple people come back um to the portfolio review for uh, uh for the art institute who were um an environment artist um and uh, the art director at cranky pants and i've been doing an internship actually at uh, a studio called Handheld Games up in Mill Creek, um, which is a, a perfect progression. We were, we were doing GBA games, and it was all uh, 2D art, pixel animation. Mm -hmm. um, and and that was feeling really, really, really nice. It still wasn't 3D stuff, uh, but that was kind of where I was. Like, okay, you know, video games can be a thing. I can handle this. But then uh, they brought me into Cranky Pants to do uh, concept art, modeling, and, and 3D animation. And I, that's where like the eureka moment really happens like okay this is going to be a thing that i do forever and ever and ever until i die cool and now now that you are doing it did you find that you were right about them clashing the other times when you're just oh like no it just thing? It, it if i was completely wrong about it um because i mean it it doesn't feel it, it's yet to feel like a real job um it's it's still real work but it doesn't i don't uh wake up every morning and and go to work and get bummed out about anything that I do. No matter, I, like, the worst day in the world making video games is still better than any other job that, that I could have had. Awesome. You guys feel that way too? Yeah. yeah. Sweet, sweet. Um, that's cool. Holly, let's ask about you. How did you, w when did you start uh, creating art and when did it, you realize that that and video games could be something together? Um, I feel like my story is similar to Doug in that I had always loved drawing and like I, you know, grew up on animated movies. So I think when I went to art school, it was with the idea of being a 2D animator. What animated movies did you love? Um, oh gosh, like old classic, you know, Beauty and the Beast and like, I don't, like even Rupert the Bear, which is like a British show <laughs> and, and like, uh, uh, Secret of Nim, Don Bluth stuff. Um, so just animation in general. Yeah, really just really crazy about just having a drawing and making it come to life mm -hmm. um, was really appealing to me. Uh, and uh, so I went to art school and like I said, with the idea of being a 2D animator, um, and also with a love for illustration. And so when I I had an internship for, for like a year that ended up being, it was for uh, traditional animation, but in Flash. And so I worked on um, a lot of uh, games for like Nickelodeon and like uh, Disney TV, like uh, just any, games on the Any website. big names you want to drop? No, I mean, <laughs> there were like little Dora Explorer games and stuff, you know, but... Um, it's not nothing, real. though. Yeah. No, it's not, Millions no. of kids <laughs> playing your game. My no. daughter loves Dora. <laughs> no, it's, it was a really cool experience, and I feel like it taught me a lot about Flash. Um, and then I feel like uh, Hairbrain contacted me because uh, they wanted, they needed an animator. And at the time, they were doing a game called Strike Fleet Omega, which was done in Flash. And so that's kind of how I ended up at this studio. And then later, um, then when we started to do Shadowrun, it was like, well, we need a 3D animator. And I was the only animator. So it was like, I guess I'm doing 3D now. <laughs> had, you, had you worked on 3D before that? Or was it like all learn by doing kind of thing? I, it was a lot of learn by doing. I had had 3D classes, but I was definitely kind of like, no, I'm going to be a 2D animator. <laughs> you know, old school. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but but I ended up really liking it, and and I feel like uh, it just kind of evolved into the game thing. But I what I really love about that is that you do I feel like get to interact with your work so much more than you know I had thought about movies and TV too. But but you know you you get to see it, but you don't get to like experience it the same way as mm-hmm. in the game. So so I think it's really cool. I'm happy with where I'm at. Great, Great. Um, <laughs> Fiona. Why don't you tell us about your path? Uh, how'd you become an artist, and then how'd you become a game artist? So I always I always was drawing when I was a kid, as long as I can remember. But I actually got into Kids like draw. Yeah, draw. <laughs> you're gonna do one thing. <laughs> draw. I started learning how to draw when I was 19. I'm not good at it. I took <laughs> yeah. Draw when you're a kid. <laughs> and I actually got into like it seems weird to call it sculpture because I made a lot of things out of clay when I was a kid, and I used to mm-hmm. sell them at the farmers market and stuff. So you just and thought then, you were playing and you were just a little artist. You didn't even know yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Entrepreneur as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah. how we'd fund our trips to Michael's is by <laughs> selling stuff. <laughs> this play buys itself. That's how they get you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we'd spend way more at Michael's than we'd make because we sold everything for like 10 cents. <laughs> <laughs> so so you start out doing 3D stuff. It's... I guess it kind of was. And then like I took a few ceramics classes like th- at like the community center or whatever. And I really enjoyed it. And then when I got to, so when I was in high school, we had like a career day and some guy came in and talked about how he worked on Wave Race for the GameCube. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is a thing. (laughs) That is really cool. And so I started looking into it more from there. And we had like recruiters from the Art Institute come to our school. So I went to their like open house and they probably showed some of that really cool concept art you were talking about. And I was like, <laughs> I want to do that. There, there were some great people out of the Art Institute. Yeah, yeah. And like right before I went there. <laughs> 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 um, so, so then I went to the Art Institute and I did that. And what was interesting is when I first started doing 3D, like it was nothing like when I was sculpting. And I was just like, wow, I, I better work on my illustration because this is not <laughs> happening. <laughs> So, so you were like, oh, I love 3D. And then you got to school and you were like, I guess 3D is never going to work out. Yeah, I was just like, I just don't know how to do this. But then like that was like working in 3D Studio Max, which I guess I just didn't work well with that interface. And then mm-hmm. once they switched over to Maya, I was like, oh, no, this is my jam. I can do this. <laughs> and so I, I and I love doing sculpting in 3D more than like whipping out all the clay. <laughs> <laughs> messy for sure yeah well it was always that we had like four cats and there was hair and everything oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like furry little sculpture yeah. Don't worry about it that was always getting in there. the white clay you were like picking it out <laughs> Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question that uh, we got from the chat and and you guys of course you can ask us questions we've only got a, a couple um, but but it was it was a while ago and it was about motion capture um, that you that. Guys, yeah, you guys do 3D animation. Do you do motion capture? We have not used any motion capture on Acropolis. Cloth is hand done. Yeah. Uh, tongue yeah, swaggling or hand done. Everything's hand done. So I saw that and I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Nothing against motion capture. Yeah, no. it, it has been yeah. used on uh, Shadowrun and yep. stuff. And I used motion capture uh, uh, on previous projects yeah. as well. There's but nothing wrong with it. N- there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that I think it wouldn't mesh with the style that we've done mm-hmm. for Necropolis. You know, it's very stylized and, and you really want to get like these big broad characters swinging heavy swords and doing yeah. backflips. So. No, throwing the motion capture balls on like a, a 10 foot spider just doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work. So, <laughs> so is that the main limitation of, of motion capture then that it just, it has to be something a person can do? Um, I don't, I don't know that that's a main limitation. Um, what it's, else is there? It, uh, well, so the biggest problem that um, that I've had with motion capture is that you're just grabbing a, a single person or a group of people or, um, and then a, a couple props. Um, and and getting the, the actors to um, fit into kind of the mold that you're building um, is not, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also the fact that um, for the most part, when dealing with mocap, it, it's a little bit tougher to deal with on just straight gameplay side, um, because what we're doing is we're creating at times like six, seven frames of transition animations or or a jump that is so physically impossible. Because as a player, um, when you press a jump button, you want to be jumping. 
Whereas in reality, um, when you go to do a jump, you have all of this anticipation. You get down, you uh, get your weight over your feet, and you jump up in the air. Um, and the timing is so is so very off that you spend a lot of time fighting them, which is why a lot of times um, mocap artists uh, will get the, the, the motion capture animation um, and they'll start stripping out as much as they can. Um, they'll start kind of distilling it down to what is the base keyframes and they use the mocap as a, uh, a guideline as much as they use it as, or probably more than they use it for um, as straight, you know, grab it, throw it in game. So, so it's just it's so hard to tweak, and you can that yeah kind of thing? yeah you're dealing you're dealing with a lot more dense data. You're dealing with uh, keyframes on on every joint, or on every control, um, on every frame. And if you're not if you're not using the right programs, um, if you're not going through something um, that'll do an auto pass at, at distilling or, or calling out keyframes like Motion Builder, um, it can be it can be intimidating for one. Um, but yeah, and I mean. Uh, Call of Duty aside, not a lot of people are mocapping dogs or mm -hmm. uh, non-human characters. Not a lot of game studios have the budget of Call of Duty. Also, a exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's no, part of it. Yeah. Um, uh, cool. That's thanks for the question. There's one other yeah, one. That's a good um, question. That's that's more of an artist question, and that's cool too. Uh, what's the difference? What's the biggest difference between retro eight-bit style art and the more modern style art for you guys? Because these days, there's been you know a rise of retro gaming or retro style gaming. That's not necessarily retro gameplay um do you guys ever entertain that notion or are you guys like we want to do more than that what do you think about the the movement these days uh at least for me i don't think of our game as a, as a retro style game um just because i wouldn't say it is I yeah no, no no, no. It, it, it's one of those weird questions uh, yeah we've got this uh type of question a lot um it, i don't know that our game was ever looked at or thought of as okay we're gonna go in a retro style um it was kind of taken into like a minimalist style mm -hmm. um a modern minimalist style as opposed to a retro style me personally i love doing retro stuff i love like uh 8-bit stuff if i could work on like a pixel hand-drawn side scroller uh that would be fun as hell cool. um uh it'd have to be the right style of game mm -hmm. um I'm not going to, you know, again, try and build Call of Duty or Madden or something in a <laughs> pixel-based style, but a uh, retro style. But yeah, I... I feel like it's it's essentially like condensing the interesting information is kind of what, what mm -hmm. Necropolis is, you know, like where where do we really want those reads? Where, you know, where do, is the information maybe less important? Like... Uh, I know we, we get the question about feet a lot, and I don't want to speak, you know, that it, it, <laughs> I love our feet. I our love feet our feet, awesome. too. And I think the thing is it's not, it, for me, I don't think of it as them not having feet. It's just that they they taper, you know, and, and mm. in the game, you know, you're you're looking at the, the arms and the swing of the sword and, and all that upper body stuff more than you are, like, watching the feet. And so it's just kind of condensing that information into a, a clean design. And almost a little bit of misdirection, right? Look over here at the sword, <laughs> don't worry about the feet. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, if you're, if you're looking at the feet during gameplay, honestly, if you're looking at uh, the player character when you're playing the video game, we're doing something wrong because you should be looking mm -hmm. at like your goal, you should be looking yeah. at the character that you're attacking, you should be looking at That's all sorts true. of stuff. Um, it's kind of, you know, in a painting you have your focal point and, and you know, everything around it and you want the composition to be good. And I think it's it's finding a way with, with all these elements in a game to still kind of drive that focal point. Let's let's talk let's talk more specifically about uh, Necropolis that you brought it back up. Um, one of the things that I think is really neat about it is the eyes of all the characters, right? That you guys have this sort of like shadow face mm -hmm. uh, around these, uh, behind these masks or these, or, or, or a wrap or something, and then these glowing eyes. Where did that come from? I'm gonna... I think Rogers drew that first, and we just thought it looked really cool. And I like it because I feel like without seeing the face, you can kind of like let yourself kind of believe that you're the character mm -hmm. more because you don't know what they look mm -hmm. like, and we do a pretty good job of covering the face every time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I think it's mysterious, and it's also, um, yeah, you can identify it, you know. It can be whatever you want it to be. 
Mm-hmm. And faces are like a huge, they're a point of debate. In, uh, yeah. They're like feet <laughs> in our game. They, where yeah. it's like, how much of a face does any character really ever have? Yeah. And like, oh, this character has the most face of any character we've done so far. Is that too much? Yeah. And yeah. there's a lot of benefit to like the the Master Chief style, where it could be anybody in yep. that thing. You know, yeah. that's, that's why Spider Man sells better than everybody else, because he's the superhero with a mask to cover. He's, yeah. he's everybody. <laughs> yeah. uh, but at the same time, there's also value in like the Nathan Drake thing, where that's a character that you learn mm-hmm. to like. Yep. Um, so did you guys go back and forth on that? Did you enter, did you entertain the notion of creating specific characters, like names and whatnot, or was it always the player chooses a style? I would. I know that you'll be dying a lot in this game, so I think another part of it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, you know it. We don't want every one of the thieves that you play to be so so different that you like mourn really mourn like the death of. Yeah. I feel like that might be part of it, but I don't want to. No, speak. you. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the genre itself kind of prevents you from having a a one identifiable individual Mm -hmm. character. Um, I know it it is done and it can be done. I mean, like some of the, uh, the creepiest moments of, uh, uh, what is it? The guys who did me boy. Um, um, I'm going to blank on the game. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, so they did uh, their roguelike. Um, and it was one in... We're calling you hashtag team no feet over here. Yeah, <laughs> nice. That, that's I will I'll, <laughs> Own it, own it. take that, yeah. Um, I mean, you guys explained it great. Like, it works. It works really well. No. Thing. And yeah. apparently, if you're noticing the feet, you're doing it wrong. So, yeah, no. Look at the sword. <laughs> you're about to die. No, Rogers explained it really well yesterday where I think he was talking about one of the characters that we were playing around with. Um, and he was like, you want to take and start off with absolutely no detail on an object and put in one detail at a time until you get to be able to recognize what that object is. And if, or no, uh, it was the opposite. Uh, if you model it way too high, you pull out detail until you can't tell what it is. Um, he's a lot better at speaking than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, you know, like you said, it has this sort of almost cartoony style, right? It's not retro, but minimalistic. Yeah. And so yeah. that's how you get that out is by making sure that like, Basically, if there was one less line, you wouldn't know what this is. And so yeah. that's how you balance that. Uh, yeah, and it, it goes so far um, just beyond the lines where it's like you, you take a look at color. And um, there was some talk about uh, like fire early on. And uh, somebody asked, uh, I think Mike McCain asked, why does it have to be orange? Why does it have to be red? I mean, it can be any color. We're in the necropolis. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you have like a, a set color palette that when you're thinking of what colors it's going to be, there's a there's like a tone or a temperature you guys look at? We do. I mean, we made a color palette early on and I know that we've strayed from it. <laughs> but we kind of try to keep things like in the cool tones and then try to pop the characters with like brighter char- colors on them than the rest of the background. Mm-hmm. Cool. Cool. How about like besides just this cool and and, and bright? Uh, wh- where else do you decide to come up with these things like this tone of this shade of blue or the shade of blue? Is it is it all from atmosphere or some of it character and like how much of it do you come up with beforehand? How does the color palette come into creation? I didn't make our color palette, <laughs> so I'm not really sure how they came up with it. Um, but I think it was. I think it's more about creating a mood in the in the scene yeah. and then making the characters fit with the environment. Um. Which is it's another like chicken and egg situation mm-hmm. where uh, we've got we've got the environment and the environment lighting, which is constantly uh, in flux. We're we're constantly uh, looking at and improving and changing. I mean, even last night they were making huge adjustments to uh, not necessarily huge, um, but uh, to me, huge adjustments in the contrast, um, which has a big effect on the colors that are displayed and the colors that you actually see, um, which trickles down from just you know the environment lighting to the character lighting to uh, details that had been put into the character textures that w- were subtle at, at one point, but are now gone. Um, so it's, it's constantly shifting. Um, so the, the mood and the palette is changing. You can look at, I mean, YouTube, our first trailer, uh, and, and look at the difference in the way that the environments look. Um, and you can see that there's, there, there is a color design, um, and it's, it's there. 
but it's changed so very much. It's it takes amazing. Us back to the notion that trailers are really works in progress. Trailers are absolutely works product. in progress. Yeah. Um, Holly, you mentioned that you uh, worked on some swords and some shields. Uh, I want to ask about that. Where, when, when coming up with something like weapons, which are so ubiquitous in gaming, almost every game has violets of some sort. Um, it's part of the great thing of it all being fictional, is yeah. that we could do this. Uh, do you do like research on classic weapons? Actually, or? what I do is animate the, the characters okay. with those weapons. So Fiona was the one, the who, one who designed who that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I designed some of the weapons, and generally I feel like for me, I just draw a bunch of silhouettes and then we decide which ones we like and then I move forward with those. But like we do have like the designers will come up with like what they want the specific weapons to do and sometimes that will affect what it looks like. Like you'll think about if it's going to hit people and make them get hit, knocked back or something, mm -hmm. like maybe you want a heavier weapon for that. So you'll think about that while you're designing it. So to what degree to what degree do you and and gameplay influence each other? Are the times when you'll make like a big old hammer and they're like, all right, now we need to make something with a big old hammer, or is it more that they tell you this needs to be big and have a wide swing? Uh, or is it again another chicken and the egg thing? I think it's a little bit of chicken and the egg thing, because they'll tell me something in the beginning and then we don't sometimes once it's finally in game, it's not exactly how you imagined it to begin with. So you have to like either scale things down or make them bigger because sometimes you can't see the action happening mm -hmm. because you know, you're know you viewing the character from behind or whatever it is. Right. So there's a lot of things that change once it's in the game already. It's a lot of back and forth to make sure it all works yeah. together. Oh yeah, that's that's definitely huge. Um, this is a great question. Uh, when, you, when you are working on the colors for a game, do you think about uh, colorblind gamers and how to make sure it's dynamic enough for them and there's different symbols and whatnot? Ooh. I do not. <laughs> but I know that I've seen them working on yeah. stuff in, for UI, like putting in numbers instead of colors or things like that. I think if your value scheme is strong enough in your environment and in your characters, if you were to go desaturate everything, you would still see what's light and what's dark. Mm -hmm. And so uh, making sure that the value scheme is really strong is is something that's that, that you want for the colors to read well, but will also work if the colors are stripped away. That so making sense. sure you have a dynamic enough color palette solves that problem on its own? Yeah, basically. well, value, value scheme. I don't know. I'm an animator. I just make <laughs> <laughs> it it does. If if you we want those bright brights and those dark darks and and making sure that there is kind of that scale of things will kind of, um, you know, I'm not an art director. I don't want to speak <laughs> for anybody. But I think that's that's. I, I feel like that's what I, I see them working yeah, on. Yeah, and I know it's a huge it's, focus on UI side. Yeah, it's yeah. a huge focus on UI side. Um. So. I want to ask now about uh, the clothing. The, the characters, so many games, it's like, here's armor, and here's gray armor, and here's red armor. And each one of the, each one of the thieves you play as seems to have a different, uh, a whole different style. Like, they almost, to me, they almost feel like they have different ethnicities. Each one. Uh, so <laughs> about where those come from and how, and like, do you just draw a bunch of different stuff and you were like, I want all of it to be in there? Well, we take, we, so sometimes we'll have like a feel for the armor that we want. Like we want this one to look like desert armor. So you'll mm -hmm. look at a lot of like Arabic armor or whatever. And like, you try to like, just get like the major parts. Cause again, you're going to distill it down into a very simplified version because it gets really busy when you get trying to get towards realism and stuff. So we, you'll like use a lot of reference, but you'll, really narrow it down and then and but like you create something that uh that is a very simplified version of the reference you've been looking at and sometimes you'll say like we want this one to look like swamp armor or desert armor but yeah that's kind of the process I use. Do you find yourself in that in that sort of distillation process do you find yourself over designing things that you're like this is too busy or do you always manage to like Yes. <laughs> and sometimes you don't know until it's in 3D already. And then yeah. you're like, I'll just delete all this, all these extra wrinkles. <laughs> well, well, great from these angles, but not when you could spin yeah. it kind of thing. And I have to say, cool. even I get excited when I, when I like, I'll play test the game to look at an animation. I'll be like, oh, I found a new outfit. I get like super <laughs> excited about it. So I feel like it adds a lot. Yeah, it does. I mean, it changes the character. It a does. A ton more than most of the stuff. Yeah. It's just, it's not just color swap. Which is great. Ballpark, how many different outfits are in the game? Oh, that's a good question. Doug. Oh my God. 
it's a hard question to answer. Is, is comedy conspiring? Because if it were like six, then you'd be like, just six no, for you guys. No, there's more. So we did. Uh, and there's a male female yeah, variant for there, each of there's them. A, every uh, single one? Every yeah. single one has cool. a male and female diff- uh, set. Um, and there are more than just you know slapped on a male rig or slapped on a female rig um, difference. And it's more than just color difference between the two as well. Um, there's 16, wow. including male and female. There's 20. You would know <laughs> more they than... They should that. play Necropolis and find out. Yeah, that's a lot, though. That's a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely one of those guys that, like, I play by myself, and I'm always yeah. changing the char- the, the costumes of my character, yep. even though nobody's going to see it but me. No, me well, too. But that's, yeah, so exactly. that's the other thing, is that they're not just... Uh, they're not just costumes, they're not just outfits. Each one has different stats, different gameplay abilities, so some move faster, uh, some jump higher, some which causes all sorts of problems when the animations play faster. And <laughs> that's just my... <laughs> that's just my issue. Um, or animations play slower. Um, yeah, some will have heavier armor. Um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, each one is almost a different character. So does each one have a unique uh, weapon and armor set as well? You can use any weapon with any armor set. Um, yeah, that's kind of one of our uh, tenets. I mean, it's very Dark Soulsy in in that aspect, where if you want to be the guy with the pointy hat wearing the gigantic act or having the gigantic sword that kind of passes through the pointy hat, that's awesome, great, <laughs> Do you? <laughs> but it does sound like it has more of like a, uh, like a re-roll thing of like you can mix and match these characters rather than oh absolutely just trying to do this thing again yep absolutely you uh so you won't ever um well the chances of you starting off the first five minutes of necropolis the same twice is, is just minuscule yeah. it's it's not going to happen you we've got a chest right in uh the opening room where um every once in a while you'll get a big gigantic sword or a huge piece of armor and you're like, this is the greatest thing ever. And then you will never get that piece <laughs> again. And or even worse, you'll see somebody else playing and get the piece of armor that you really wanted. Um, and when you do get that armor, I feel like, and this isn't part of the game, but I always feel like I die fast. Oh, like, you, I'm, like, you, I'm, like, I'm like, I have this great sword yep. and it's done. So you're like super excited. <laughs> and you're like, I can just take out <laughs> the reckless. world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. You're yep. just too much confidence. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> um, by the way, it was mentioned on the chat. I think the game that you were, that you were trying to remember earlier was Binding of Isaac. Binding of Isaac, yes. I played way too much of that game, but I'm horrible with names, so uh, I apologize. He forgets my That's name. Okay. I do. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, so so the, the nature of Necropolis is that it's, it's, it's procedurally generated, right? So like you yep. said, you're never going to play the same thing twice. Yep. Uh, do you guys have to make like 12 times as much content art-wise? How much does that add to uh, the job you have to do in the art department? I feel like we do. Uh, yeah. Honestly, yeah. I feel like we... Um, we have to deal with it in a bit more of uh, an abstract way where we're not, uh, we don't know for a fact that this character is going to appear when you're this far uh, mm-hmm. through the game every single time mm-hmm. and we're not going to have a big character intro cinematic moment and um, we can't really predict any of that stuff. I mean, you, we can we can limit it and we do so that you're not facing like a ridiculously overpowered enemy on the first level because that would suck. Mm-hmm. Um, we we want to be, you know, unpredictable but not punitive. Um, and design has done a great job. Um, and engineering has done a great job on on building the game in that way. Um, but yeah, I feel like we've done, especially with the team that we have, mm-hmm. um, the size of the team that we have, we've done a lot of content. Um, all for you guys. <laughs> all for you. <laughs> I mean, a, re- a replayable game, like these days, that's one of the things you want, right? Because you want to be able to sit in your couch and just like, right. it's an investment. You spend, keep it interesting. You, know, yeah. you keep these things for so long and they don't expire. Um, so that's that's huge. Um, man, you guys get me really excited about this game. <laughs> uh, I apologize. It won't happen again. <laughs> you do not make promises you cannot keep, sir. <laughs> um, we're excited for Battletech, too. Uh, I want to ask about um, symbols and that th- symbols are such an iconic part of any fiction um, right down like wearing one on my shirt right now. That yeah, seems yeah, yeah. obvious, but somebody had to design this. Yep. Uh, we, who came up with the, with the symbols and, and where did they come from in Necropolis? I think McCain started with Yeah, the I think it was McCain and Rogers, uh, our two art directors. Um, they're responsible for a lot of the iconology, mm-hmm. iconography um, in our world. Mm-hmm. They came up with the uh, 
triangle with a circle in it. Completely original uh, design. Nobody's ever done a triangle mm -hmm. and a circle. Never seen those shapes before. It's the first. Never. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think they were responsible for. But that's all one of the parts that's so cool about it, on. though, is that we've seen triangles and circles yep. our entire lives, and yet the, the symbolism in this game made me, you know, it, was, it, it made me feel like there was an actual cohesion of like almost a culture here. Yep. Um, so do you guys do you guys know how you keep that all together, or is it just because two dudes just made it? I think. Well, I think I, Chris Rogers is always thinking about it. Like one thing I really like about his original character designs is below each one is kind of like a symbol that that kind of shows off the character. You know, so I think our thief was like condensed into a triangle, and yeah. then each each character had like a little symbol below it, and and you could just tell he was already thinking about that mm -hmm. language and everything. Yeah, that's, that's. I mean, that's the great part about working with uh, great artists and great art directors is that they're they're constantly abstracting the stuff into into those shapes to the point where, like, uh, a certain type of character in our game will always have like a, a, that that triangle head, um, and it's built into every single part. It seems of every single character of that type, mm -hmm. um, and like there's. Uh, even to the, the the point where there's a very specific color of red that we use in in the trailers. Mm -hmm. That's Necropolis red that mm -hmm. I, I have memorized the RGB value. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually pretty cool. It's dedication. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, and it, it's 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 that type of that dedication and that forethought that um, that sort of keeps that that constant theme. Um, it's incredibly invaluable, and it takes a certain type of person uh, to do it. And we're we're really fortunate to have those people on our team. Mm -hmm. Do you guys find yourself glad that you're at a relatively smaller company like Harebrain Schemes? Or do you think that if you were at a bigger one, let's not, you know, badmouth anybody. But do you think that this cohesion is, is easier to work with because of, of the group you're with? Yes. Mm -hmm. I definitely think that. Because, <laughs> like, like, at a previous company I worked at, we had, like, art directors in offices. And I feel like just, like, that wall there it made it like really awkward to just go into the room and be like, I need your direction on this. <laughs> yeah, you're not invading somebody's personal space. Yeah, you always feel like you're interrupting when you're like. <laughs> yeah. I, I also feel like it's given me the chance to uh, take part in a lot of different roles I wouldn't otherwise. You know, I, I've been straight up animator on, on Necropolis, but um, in projects before, like... Oh, you did concept art, too. Oh, I did some concept art. But even that, the fact that I get to animate, but there's also, you know, it's like, hey, pitch into this concept mm -hmm. art part. That's really exciting for me, because I love animation and traditional art, and I feel like at a big studio, it'd be like, well, we have people for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. And we do have people for that, but, you know, since it is such a small team, I feel like I get to take a uh, part in, in more different aspects of it. Keeps things fresh for sure cool are there any other things you guys have done out like like outside of art for the games that you've done or anything that you've been like oh they just need you to do this that's really cool i modeled the first version of the kukuri mm, and the shield for necropolis that was quickly thrown away <laughs> um <laughs> and replaced uh fortunately to the benefit of all I don't want to speak for Fiona, but she sh like sewed together a really badass <laughs> version of one of our little monster characters. <laughs> why, why, why were you sewing together a character? Because we should be merchandising this game, and I feel like no one's listening to me. <laughs> awesome! It was an awesome <laughs> plush. So cute. You um, just, you just character. made a she plush just, version of your character because yeah, yeah. you thought yeah. it'd be cool. And I yeah. came in, and it was on like our snack bar, and it was like what? <laughs> it was pretty awesome. That was really cool. Like, you, look at you in charge of marketing. <laughs> they still don't listen. <laughs> well, they're listening now. Really? Yes. And, and 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 now that now that people know that, there's going to be a yeah. lot of outcry. Everybody, including me, wants uh, this now. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Where is this plushie she made? Well, yeah. asking for. <laughs> well, yeah. um, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was. We just got a couple minutes left. Okay. Uh, we're running out of time. That went um, by fast. Yeah, <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. Um, that's about most of the stuff I want to ask about. I was going to ask about the bodies, which you guys led into that with the feet, and um, that you have these sort of like top-heavy bodies. But I want to ask uh, more about um, monsters specifically. Whereas, is there like, is there a degree to which you're thinking this is going to be like this animal, or is there is it just kind of out of nowhere? Because um, the, the creation of a monster, the creative creature of cre creation of something alien 
in fiction can leave a big mark, right? We never heard of orcs before Tolkien, mm -hmm. and now they're part of all fantasy. Everybody has them, yeah. You know, um, are there any certain things you've created that you're like, this is this is my thing? I've worked on a lot of it, so that's kind of hard. They're all, <laughs> like, they're they're all, all I would say they're all look like kind of mine. <laughs> so the, the monsters of the game then are that unique that it's not going to be like, oh, oh that's a like, bear with spikes. I, I definitely feel like we reference a lot because it's, I don't know, it's just hard to like come up with something totally off the top of our heads. But like we do have some characters that just have bizarre anatomy where it's just like many limbs. I didn't work on those ones though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like it comes out of nowhere, though. I feel like it's usually a fusion of, of different creatures or, or different, yeah. like a, like one of our creatures is the digger, and I know our, our designer, Dennis, just wanted something to burrow, and so that kind of like influenced his design, but he doesn't look like a mole or anything. He looks like a, I don't A know. digger. He looks like a digger. Yeah, he looks exactly <laughs> like a digger. <laughs> cool, though. So, the, but the unique monster is that you're just like, this will be badass, and yeah. then it is. Yeah. <laughs> no, we definitely got some unique stuff. The and they always things serve a purpose, too. You know, and... they, like, I would say that they they are not unmotivated in their design. Like, it yeah. always yeah. hints at, at what, what you're going to have to fight them for. Or, you know, we've got yeah. a big guy with four arms, and he uses them. <laughs> yeah, the Shadowborn has arms on his head because arms on your head. <laughs> <laughs> He all uses right. all his arms, too, actually. <laughs> That's, unfortunately, all the time we have for today. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank uh, you. Thank you for having us. Uh, before we go, uh, tell us where we could find Necropolis online and when we can look for it. Uh, Necropolis.com, uh, I think, is our, our website, or is it Necropolisgame.com? I think it's Necropolisgame.com. I would hope so. Um, <laughs> Google Necropolis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and then coming out, uh, oh, God, this... Summer on uh, PS4, uh, Xbox One, and uh, Steam. Yep. All right. Look out for Necropolis this awesome. summer. Thank you guys again for coming by. Uh, <laughs> stick you. around. Up next is Rabbit Stew, as always. Uh, we're going to be off next week. We'll be back in two weeks uh, for more Easter eggs. Thanks for tuning in.